So in this lecture, I'd like to talk about uh, talking about uh, two-phase, two-component systems and we've already talked about, let me get a new pen, situations in which we had the amount of B components, we have pure A, pure B, and then we're plotting the Gibbs energy. <clears throat> and if we know pure A and pure B, G A, G B, and we say, okay, we got some uh, direct line, some uh, a direct line averaging of A and B, right? So this is, a, again, a picture in which we have a system of pure A, pure B, then the Gibbs free energy of the system is equal to the mole fraction of A. So let's say we pick some particular composition, call this uh, X B star. So this makes this uh, one minus X B star G A plus X B star G B. So this is the mole fraction. It's also, if this is our phase, our phase is pure A. Then this is also equal to the phase fraction of A, G A plus the phase fraction of B, G B. And we know that this can be handled using that so-called inverse lev lever rule. So this would be uh, the phase fraction of, of A would be determined by this distance divided by the total length. So that would be uh, one minus XB star over well, one, right? Which again, we've already got there. And the same thing here, this would be um, this distance divided by the total. So that's X B star divided by one. Now, what I'd like to talk about is I'd like to talk about, and again, this is a, I should point this out. This is a constant temperature and pressure. So we're only varying the composition. What I'd like to talk about is again, at a particular temperature and pressure, what happens when we have Gibbs free energy curves that look like this. alpha, and we got another one here, say beta, <clears throat> and we have some composition here. This is going to be our uh, X B star. So now we are no longer talking about pure A and pure B, but instead we have a phase mixture of alpha and beta. And alpha has a particular value of xA alpha, xB alpha, and beta also xA beta, xB beta. So how do we think about this? Well, let's just say that we can draw up a vertical line, and we know we can do that. And let's just pick 
some arbitrary points on that, say here and here. Let's say, what if this is x b alpha and this is x b beta. Well, if we have that, now we have this picture again here, right? Because we have the Gibbs energies and we can figure out the phase fraction from the inverse lever rule, which means we can draw in some line between the two. And then the phase fractions will be determined by the uh, fraction of uh, beta is going to be this distance divided by that using the inverse level rule. So that would be uh, x b star minus x b alpha divided by x b beta minus x b alpha. And then the fraction of alpha you can write out or you can just say is one minus the fraction of Sorry, beta. <clears throat> and then presumably we know our Gibbs free energy curves. So that would be G at G alpha at X, B alpha, and that would be G beta at X, B beta. So now G is equal to F alpha G alpha at X B alpha plus the fraction of beta G beta at X B beta. And that's what we'd have. Now, that's good, except what we know is we also know that this is probably not an equilibrium. It was just a guess, right? And the reason we know it's not an equilibrium you know, we know that the temperature and the pressure are in equilibrium, right? Because we, we've defined, you know, T, P as a constant. But what's not in equilibrium is the chemical potentials. So this is the chemical potential of... Uh, chemical potential of A in the alpha phase. This is the chemical potential of B in the alpha phase. And that's this is the chemical potential of A for the beta phase. And this is the chemical potential of B in the beta phase. So what does that mean? Well, they're not equal to each other, right? And we have that the chemical potential of B alpha and the chemical potential of B beta is greater. And we have the chemical potential of, sorry, oops, sorry. Oh, no, that's right, that's right, sorry. Chemical potential of A alpha and the chemical potential of A beta is less. And what that means is it means that if we have our picture of our system with alpha, and beta, and we have a uh, 
little external container. So a trick that I use when I'm thinking about chemical potentials is I have uh, external storage containers that I can take atoms in and out of. Oops. So because the chemical potential of uh, B alpha is greater than B beta, if I were to take a B atom out of the alpha and then put it into the beta, delta G would be the energy to take a B out of the alpha and the energy to add a B to the beta. And this, because that's larger than that, is going to be less than zero. So this spontaneously happens. Similarly, if I were to take an A atom out of the beta, put it into the storage container, and then put it into the alpha, this delta G is minus mu A beta plus mu A alpha. And again, this is larger, sorry. This is larger. So this is less than zero. It spontaneously happens. And when that happens, when we're taking B atoms out of the alpha and into the beta, B atoms, B atoms out of the alpha, that changes this composition, pushing it closer to pure A. And when we're taking A atoms out of the beta and putting it in the alpha, that pushes this closer to pure B. So what happens is that essentially we've moved a little bit along the Gibbs free energy curves because we changed composition. And in doing that, we have changed the chemical potential slightly in terms of the alpha phase and in terms of the beta phase. And you can imagine this process happening repeatedly, being driven by diffusion, and diffusion is being driven by the gradient in the chemical potential. It's going to keep being driven right up until we've achieved a common tangent line. So at this point, mu A alpha equals mu A beta. And here, mu B alpha equals mu B beta. And we've achieved equilibrium. So the practical matter here is that now we go back to our expression for the Gibbs free energy of the system. We have this common tangent. We know the overall composition of the system, right? That hasn't changed. We've moved atoms back and forth. 
between the alpha and the beta, but we haven't added anything. We haven't added anything from the outside. So that keeps that composition the same. Which means that we still have. Let me redraw this just for the sake of uh, clearing up the mess a little bit. Alpha, beta. So now we have uh, a common tangent line. The common tangent line gives us equilibrium. We have the composition of the system. We have the composition of the alpha and the composition of the beta. We have the Gibbs free energy of the alpha. We have the Gibbs free energy of the beta. And we have the phase fraction of these, phase fraction of beta is uh, Xb star minus Xb alpha over Xb beta minus Xb alpha. And the phase fraction of alpha is x b. Well, let's change colors here. So the phase phase fraction of the alpha is x b beta minus x b star over x b beta minus x b alpha is equal to one minus f beta. And we can now express the Gibbs free energy is Gibbs free energy uh, is the uh, fraction of the alpha times the Gibbs free energy of the alpha at x b alpha plus the phase fraction of the beta gives free energy of the beta at x b beta. And we got these. So in order for this to be something we can do, we have to know the form of Gibbs free energy curves, and we have to know the composition of the system. So this goes back to, you know, if we can compute or if we can measure the thermophysical properties, use the thermophysical properties to back out what the functional form of the Gibbs free energy curves, then for anywhere, we can determine the phase fraction and the Gibbs free energy. Okay, now what happens as we change our composition? Closer and closer and closer here, we keep approaching that edge. Well, as we approach that, we reach some point where we, we basically are getting less and less of the beta, right? So we're getting a smaller phase fraction of beta as we change the system composition to the left. And at some point, that phase fraction of beta goes to zero. And at that point, we're now in a single phase system. So that means that when we draw this common tangent, 
we're bracketing a range of alpha plus beta. And along that range, our free energies are defined by this linear sum. So that linear sum is this exact line. Once we've stepped outside of that line, we no longer have a two-phase mixture. We now have a single phase, alpha only, and we know it's alpha only because the Gibbs free energy of alpha is uh, lower than beta in this range. And if you said, well, what's the free energy of the system? Well, the free energy of the system then is just gonna follow the Gibbs free energy curve for the alpha phase. So that's alpha, beta. And outside of the alpha beta range on the right-hand side, we now have beta only and the Gibbs free energy of the beta phase will follow the curve up. So what does this mean for phase diagrams? Well, this is our phase diagram, right? This is uh, at, a, at a given temperature, at a given pressure. That's what our phase diagram looks like. So imagine we have a at some temperature, say uh, T1, a Gibbs free energy curve that looks like uh, alpha liquid. And then over here, temperature versus Xb, this is Xb, T1, we have liquid phase ranging across. At some point, as we cool, and we know this happens because we've seen this many times, we have a Gibbs curve and we now have the liquid and the alpha and they touch. And that's going to be our liquidus. Or I should say, in the case of uh, A and B, this is going to be the melting point of B, right? So this is, uh, what I call this, I call this uh, T2, 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 liquid. This is the melting point of pure B. We continue to cool to T3. We now have something that looks like this. This is our liquid. This is our alpha. And we have a point of common tangent lines. So here's liquid, here's alpha. This is alpha plus liquid. Which means up here at T3, we have liquid, liquid plus alpha, alpha. Keep cooling to T4. Liquid alpha common tangent line. Alpha plus liquid, liquid alpha, which gives us T4. 
T4. And finally, T5, where we have, this is going to be uh, alpha, and this is going to be liquid, and this is going to be a melting point. So it's going to be the point where five, and that gives us something that looks like that kind of a rough sketch, sorry about that. But you, you get the idea, right? We get a two-phase region separating two single-phase regions. We have uh, liquidus lines. I L I Q U I D U S. We have a solidus line, and we have two endpoints. One point there, which is the melting point of pure A, and a point here, which is the melting point of pure B. So it's worth pointing out that when you have a Sing, uh, a component as opposed to a uh, mixture, for example, pure A or pure B. And these can also be stoichiometric compounds. For example, this could be, uh, you know, lead, you know, uh, gold or uh, copper. They have a, a phase diagram like this, or they could be uh, compounds that, that mix perfectly as well. Uh, that's where you get melting points when you have a alloy of say, you know, AUCU, then you have a solidus and liquidus line and you have a two phase region. Um, the interesting point here is that, uh, again, this is the, the simplest possible phase diagram, right? The simplest possible binary phase diagram. Uh, we can increase complexity some. Uh, if you wanted to imagine, imagine a uh, phase diagram that looks like this, or a Gibbs free energy curve that looks like this. And these do exist. liquid and some whatever alpha phase. And imagine that as this cools, it goes through a transition like this. Right? If we had something like this, where we've got liquid and uh, solid, then we would have two different two phase regions. And not only that, but these two phases are different phases. Now they, they share the same phase diagram, right? So I'm, I'm calling this uh, I'm calling this alpha, right? So we can still call this the Gibbs free energy, the alpha phase. But as we draw this out, this is the uh, alpha prime, alpha prime plus liquid, liquid alpha double prime plus liquid and alpha double prime. Why do we have to specify alpha prime 
is not alpha double prime. We have to specify that because if we took alpha prime and alpha double prime and we were to touch them together, right? This is the chemical potential of uh, A element. Again, we're doing A and B of alpha double prime. This is the chemical potential of A alpha prime. They're not in equilibrium. So they're different phases. We have over here, alpha double prime in equilibrium with liquid. And we have over here, alpha double, alpha single prime in equilibrium with liquid. And what you're basically getting here is you're getting a uh, kind of interesting diagram in which you have Uh, liquid, um, alpha prime plus liquid, alpha double prime plus liquid. And then below this, so below this point, you have alpha. And that's because as this pulls up, as that liquid Gibbs free energy pulls up, whoop, Man, having a hard time with that. These get closer and closer together. The chemical potentials are basically moving together right up to the point that we have this congruent point. This is alpha, this is liquid. And at that congruent point, this is clay. At that congruent point, alpha prime prime and alpha prime become equivalent. So now they just become alpha. So in your phase diagram, you would specify here, alpha double prime, alpha prime, and then alpha. So this explains, or this lecture explains, uh, the concept of the common tangent line between two phases in a binary system. And uh, well, it's worth pointing out that as we go to higher order, instead of being a line, for example, if we had three components, it's no longer a line, but it's going to be a plane. Uh, and it's the same idea. You have to have equilibrium and we showed we showed here uh, the origin of this common tangent, the derivation of the Gibbs free energy along that tangent line, and the consequences that this will have for well, phase diagrams.